Uh, a special welcome to our friends in the Irish Film Institute, of course, and, and uh, great to be online with you uh, again uh, through this process of the awards. It really uh, is a well-deserved piece of recognition for an important piece of work. Let me go back to the start. The Digital Preservation Coalition has been running uh, the Digital Preservation Awards since 2004. It's one of the first things we did there for as a coalition, and it recognises, I suppose, that initial impetus behind the DPC, which was around awareness raising and trying to really get kind of attention and celebration to work that was often not recognised and not celebrated prior to that. So it's a well-established programme of work. In 2014, we uh, innovated a little. We came up with a, a couple of more categories, new categories for the awards, including the award for which IFI, uh, which IFI was awarded, which is the award for safeguarding the digital legacy. The, the theory behind the award was fairly straightforward. Over the years, we had seen quite a lot of, especially large research projects, well-funded European Union projects uh, in particular, uh, which had made tremendous strides in the development of tools in digital preservation, but whereby their very nature uh, tended to be research-led. Uh, we recognise that actually digital preservation is not just a research endeavour. It is also, uh, and perhaps, perhaps even more importantly, uh, a question about getting on and doing, about applying tools, about applying wisdom in a, in a thoughtful way. Uh, to get on and do the preservation work that is going to be required to take those steps that are important. That was the thinking behind the introduction of the uh, Award for Safeguarding the Digital Legacy, which was introduced in 2014. The first winners, uh, you might recall, the University of Manchester for a really uh, great project, uh, well-deserved uh, recognition for the preservation of the Carconet email archive. Uh, and then again in 2016, uh, in a nice touch, uh, the award was won by the Amsterdam Museum uh, for their work in saving uh, uh, early web resources relating to the city of Amsterdam. Uh, obviously, it was a, a great project, but also I, I kind of mention a, a kind of affection for the project because it was indeed the Amsterdam Museum uh, that we subsequently uh, made the award in 2018. So it felt a little bit as Marcel Rass uh, wisely said on the night, it felt a little bit like the Digital Preservation Awards and the Digital Preservation Community were coming home uh, when we received such a warm welcome uh, at the Amsterdam Museum. Anyway, enough about uh, history. Let's talk now about the award in 2018. So let me give you the commendation for the award. The Award for Safeguarding the Digital Legacy celebrates the practical application of preservation tools to protect at-risk digital objects. It draws attention to concrete efforts to ensure important elements of our generation's digital memory, memory remains available for future generations. Uh, it must illustrate a clear understanding of the risks that digital objects face and the reasons for ensuring that they are properly managed. It is above all an exemplar case study in why preservation matters, and it must be capable of being described in terms that are readily understood. That's the call we put out, looking for nominations against that heading uh, early in 2018. And as is always the case, and you've heard me say before on these webinars, we were uh, astonished and delighted as ever to receive as many nominations as we did. The award categories, uh, every single one of them uh, received uh, an increased number of nominations. Uh, and so I say that by way of, I suppose, uh, identifying the, the, the real challenge, the real, uh, you know, the, the, the competition uh, that was associated with this was uh, entirely uh, uh, real. As you may recall, the coalition uh, is it's not simply just a matter for the judges to decide. Uh, as part of the finalist process, as part of the shortlisting, we take some time to consult the digital preservation community uh, about our finalists. Uh, and I should stop for a moment and acknowledge also the other finalists uh, in this category. Uh, which were not just IFI, 
but also a very impressive local authority digital preservation consortium uh, for local government agencies in particular the south of England, led in the county of Dorset, uh, and also the digital transfer project at the UK Parliamentary Archives, uh, which has solved or addressed the tricky issue of uh, making sure uh, that uh, records make their way out of an EDRMS into a preservation system, which is a, a well-known and kind of well-loved challenge for digital preservation. Uh, and finally, uh, if, uh, if that wasn't grand enough, uh, the White House, uh, more accurately, the White House Historical Association, who have done some amazing work uh, with effectively with facial recognition technologies to open up and to catalogue uh, the tremendous photographic archive associated with uh, what they describe as life in the 20th century White House. Everyone that you really matters in any historical sense uh, is represented in one form or another uh, in that archive. So that's the context, not simply of the competition, uh, but also of the other finalists that were selected uh, to go forward for the, the final round. As I say, we put all of these forward to the DPC and the broader digital preservation community, and we asked people what they thought. And, and I hope you'll forgive me for reading out uh, one or two of the comments we got back. It's not simply a process of voting. It's also a process of, uh, of gathering kind of insights from the community about what matters to them. So I'll give you three. I won't list them all because there's quite a thick file and that would take too long. Uh, one comment. I love the boldness of the IFI in deciding to press ahead in adverse circumstances with their sights firmly set on the advancement of the tool set, no matter what obstacles lay before them. A second comment, digital preservation can only be achieved through sharing and community support. The development of open, to open sorry, the development of tools for a common problem that are made available via open source is an exemplification of this. And finally, it's great to see open source tools coming out of a project like this. This is what the digital preservation community is all about. So to paraphrase that last comment, it would appear from these comments, you know, that IFI in this process has really exemplified not just the technical merits, not simply the identification and getting on and doing preservation, but there's an attitude and a willingness and an energy behind their work, which is hugely to be commended. And that's the context, really, for the presentation of this award. I think that's all I wanted to say by way of introduction. I hope I've built you up uh, all sufficiently for what's about to follow. And it's therefore my great pleasure to hand over to Cassandra, to Kieran, to Raylene, to talk to us slightly more uh, about this project. Hi. Hi, yeah. How's everybody? I'm Raylene. Cassandra. And Kieran is in the corner hiding away. <laughs> We just so, thought we'd say hi first before we begin. Um, and may we also apologise for the beautiful decoration behind us. Uh, this is a working office and you may see people coming in and out, but hopefully it won't be too distracting. Okay, so we're going to break this down into three, actually four bits. I'm going to start off and give you a bit of the context, which I think is important. As William mentioned, um, there's almost a, an ethos behind everything we do in digital preservation. Um, and I think the context of where this project and our approach to digital preservation is something that's important to get across. Then I'm going to hand over to Raylene, who is going to dig a little bit deeper into the Loopline project itself. Um, some of the challenges uh, that we came up against and how we approach those. Then you'll be hearing from Karen, who's going to excitingly do a, a live demonstration um, of some of the tools that we created for uh, the Loopline project. And then at the very end, I'm just going to sum up, um, I suppose, with uh, a summary of the outcomes and what we're going to do next. And if people have questions, we're, we'll be more than happy to answer them. And I just want to say thank you again to the DPC for giving us this opportunity. Um, hearing William talk about this 
category and the amazing projects that were um, in the category with us just makes me shocked all over again that we actually won. But um, it's it's a wonderful thing to have that validation from the community and to be part of that community. So without further ado, let's get started. Yeah, there we go. So just in case you, well, you can't see Karen because he's hiding, but um, they, these are the three of us that will be presenting today. Um, I'm head of the IFI Irish Film Archive um, here at the Irish Film Institute. Uh, Raylene is our Digital Collections and Access Manager, and Kieran is our Data and Digital Systems Manager. So we all have uh, our own role to play in this project. So in terms of a little bit of context, um, the Irish Film Archive is part of the Irish Film Institute. The Irish Film Institute is Ireland's national cultural institution for film, so the home of film in Ireland. Our um, overall mission is to exhibit, educate and preserve and we do the preservation bit through the Irish Film Archive which is our national collection of moving image heritage. We are custodian of about 30,000 cans of film, 115,000 broadcast tapes and we have taken in material from a wide range of donors um, over the last 30 or so years. So that includes um, production companies, ordinary people who would give us collections, but we also take in material from the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland, Screen Ireland and the Arts Council, who are the three big main funders of Moving Image in Ireland. Our collections are very broad um, and they span 1897 to the present day and are kept in climate control vaults here in the centre of Dublin and then also at an off-site um, facility as well. So the bit that we're concerned with today is the IFI's digital mandate. Um, what we need to be able to do in terms of our collections is to accept material that is being um, created in a digital form uh, by the broadcast and film industry and then make sure that that is adequately preserved and made accessible into the future. So that's one workflow, one pro problem we have to deal with. The other issue is the digitization and preservation of existing analog material. So taking our film and tape collections um, in a high resolution, in a digital format and having the um, processes uh, around that to make sure that they don't deteriorate and that they will also be available. And the reason for having to do that in many cases is deterioration of the original formats or then obsolescence with um, equipment. In terms of other digital drivers, I mean there are many um, as you'll be aware of, but just in terms of moving image, um, it's much cheaper to create um, moving image on film rather than having to go through the very convoluted process of printing onto film. Um, it's much cheaper to distribute. Uh, if you think about a feature film having five or six large cans of film that have to be posted around the world, um, it's much easier to send a tiny little hard drive. Um, lossless copying, so you can copy multiple times without losing any of the quality whereas with film each generation deteriorates or there's a loss of, of quality and also as you play film each time it's played it, there will be a little bit more damage created um, so it gets worn out over time so if you're at the end of a run um, of a 35 millimeter print you're going to see a lot more scratching and um, various different things that will detract from the, the quality. Oh, people like that nowadays. Um, but with digital, it'll remain the same throughout, hopefully. Um, the other great thing about digital is that it opens up a whole range of access um, activities. And we'll talk a little bit about one of those later on. But for us, in terms of our collections, they were only really available at site-specific screenings that we did. Um, or the odd time we would put together DVDs um, of material that we would publish from the collections. But it's much more restrictive than um, 
through digital formats. Now we have the IFI player, which allows us to make large amounts of material from our collections available and to put a context on them as well. So that's been another great thing. But the main reason, even though they all sound like great reasons, um, to go digital was that we simply had absolutely no choice. Um, in Ireland, uh, like many countries, there was a concerted um, government funded push towards moving the film exhibition industry to digital. So a scheme was set up which people were allowed to apply for grants to assist them with um, installing the digital projectors and so on. So for us as an organisation that takes in uh, films that are created by the various different uh, government organisations in the country, uh, they suddenly went digital overnight, which meant that we had to as well. It was a big challenge for us and one that took us a while to get to grips with. And the main reason um, for this was the speed of change. So if you think about film and film exhibition, uh, the technology really hadn't changed very much um, apart from colour, sound and so on. But the actual mechanism um, of producing film, uh, viewing film, storing film had really not changed hugely in about a century. So all of a sudden we had this massive change uh, with digital technology and digital technology, as you all know, changes constantly. It's something that we have to constantly keep up to date with and um, review. It was a whole new set of technical and financial challenges for us as archivists who had worked in an analog world. Um, and required a complex set of IT solutions, something that we were very um, nervous about because we didn't really come from that background. Um, when we started to look at this, there was a lack of consensus about standards or formats for digital preservation. I think that's becoming a little um, bit more uh, agreed. There's more consensus around it, but it was something that uh, you know we had to do a lot of research into the other problem that we found was that there was a lack of understanding at um, stakeholder, funder and policy maker level. So, um, and we still get it to this day, that's why we're such big advocates for digital preservation and waving the flag. Uh, a lot of people think, oh, it's digital, sure, that means it will cost you nothing to preserve, it will be really easy and you never have to look at it again. I'm sure you've all heard that story a million times. Um, so it's something that we had to try and raise awareness of the real challenges that are there with digital preservation in terms of ongoing investment, ongoing upskilling, ongoing um, funding. Um, and that leads into the last one, so budget, the initial cost and then the ongoing costs. Uh, we often saw where potential funders would think that they would just have, you know, you could have one outlay once and then your problems fixed in terms of digital preservation and they don't realize that things have to change um, and that we have to update our equipment um, and our file formats and our procedures and so on on a regular basis. So um, how did we address this problem? Well we decided as good archivists to do it in a very methodical way um, and we set up two internal research groups to look at digital preservation and how we would go about it. We researched the activities of colleagues globally and examined the various recommendations of expert and professional bodies. We looked at international examples of best practice relating to a variety of different areas. Um, and then we worked with our technical partners to formulate a scalable, cost-effective and practical digital preservation strategy. So in the process of doing this research, um, we were able to identify what the, the main requirements for us in any um, solution that we decided to go for would be. And um, flexibility is the first one. So we really needed to have systems that were designed on a modular basis so that each component could function individually um, as well as part of a larger network to give us that flexibility. 
uh, scalability, we needed to be able to scale up and down depending on the type of project that we were working on. Sometimes we work on large digital preservation projects, sometimes we're working on much smaller things. Um, and also, we aren't always sure when we're going to get funding. So if we um, do a grant application and we are suddenly able to scale up, we don't want to have to start from scratch. We want to be able to add bit from as we need. And then sustainability. Um, it was really important for us to look at that aspect because as we've all seen with many projects um, in the past, you may be in a position where you get a large amount of funding that allows you to start off a project, but then the funding isn't there um, over a period of time, so it isn't sustainable. So we had to look at our own organizational resources. We had to look at new partner agreements with um, the Arts Council, the World Casting Authority Department in Screen Ireland, and look at how if we began this um, digital journey, to use that hackneyed word, um, that we would be able to, to continue on it and it wouldn't hit um, a, a brick wall at some point. So the way that we did um, address it after doing all of this research was we created um, a digital strategy document. So a digital preservation and access strategy document, which we still use to this day. Um, it's coming to the end of its life, but it's been a very useful tool for us. Um, we approached the government and industry for financial support to allow us to put in um, our initial infrastructure and then to develop the, the various different tools that we need to. Um, we contacted the broader community, so not just archivists, but you know, um, technologists, preservationists in general around the world um, and developed some really good and beneficial international relationships. Um, that helped us to start implementing open source solutions and introduce a range of microservices. We also at that time were able to introduce in-house scanning and restoration um, and all of that led to our ability to make our collections available via the IFI player, which has been a wonderful way also to promote our digital preservation work because we now have um, a, a window onto the collections and a, and a window onto our work. So in terms of uh, this particular project that we're going to speak about, um, we received funding from the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland. They have an archiving scheme um, to allow us to assess, conserve, catalog, and digitize and then make available the collection of an independent production company called Loopline. Um, and Raylene is going to speak a little bit more about what that means. But just to put this in context from um, a digital preservation point of view, it was the first project that we were able to put our digital preservation and access strategy document and um, the core principles into action end-to-end -end and to use the IFI scripts that Karen will talk about. Um, our, our principles are collaboration, empowerment, advocacy, uh, policy and standards. So we want to use best practice, use standards, have good policy decisions, but also be advocates for digital preservation, empower ourselves and others um, to find solutions and then collaborate as much as possible. We wouldn't be in the position that we're in now if we hadn't been able to contact and work with um, some amazing people around the world. So Raylene is going to tell you a little bit more about Loopline and then she'll hand over to Karen. Hiya, this is Raylene speaking now. I don't know if you can see me, but that's me anyway, if you can. Um, Okay, so just first of all, the team that was involved, there was the three of us, we're on the Loopline project. Um, but we also got uh, two other people on board to help us here in the IFI, and that was Eva Fitzmaurice and Brian Cash. And then over in Loopline, Shane Mary Doyle, who's the filmmaker, who's the founder of Loopline Film Limited, um, was on hand to provide us with endless tales from the past 25 years um, and anecdotes. And then Eugene Finn was the cataloger who did the descriptive cataloging for the project. 
So what is loop line film? I'm just going to show you, I'll speak in the background here when I'm showing you some images from loop line. So uh, loop line film limited is an award winning film and broadcast production company. It was set up in 1992 by Shane Mary Dorr. Um, he had a specific intention of making creative documentaries for television. So in essence, over the 25 years um, between when he started Loopline and when we started this project, he captured a social history of Ireland in the making. Um, 25 years of images of Irish society in urban and rural settings covers key areas of Irish history and the arts. Uh, Shea was and is a prolific filmmaker. Um, over the course of three decades, the company positioned itself at the heart of independent broadcasting in Ireland. Shea decided to close down um, the company in 2017, so he approached us in 2015, um, us, the IFI, uh, to help him archive the content that he had amassed over the past 25 years. And as you can imagine, that uh, archive that he had amassed was extensive. Um, the content contained over 900 hours of footage, broadcast programs, um, finished broadcast programs along with hundreds of hours of rushes and off cuts and unedited interviews. Up until this point it had been kept in Shay's offices but now it needed to be uh, put in climate control vaults and looked after digitally by ourselves. As uh, Kaza said we received funding from the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland through the archive funding scheme um, and were able to work with Loopline in order to uh, preserve this content forever and ever and ever and ever. Amen. Um, so just want to kind of uh, explain the importance essentially of this content and why it was something that was so important to our country. So um, there was titles like, uh, included in the art in the in this content is titles like Patrick Cavanagh, No Man's Fool, Alive, Alive, Oh, Reckoning for Dublin, John Ford, Dreaming the Quiet Man, Hidden Treasures, which was a, you know, a, a documentary which has been understood to be one of the most important documentary series about Ireland that's made in the past uh, few decades. Um, the content covered social history and social justice, development and redevelopment of Dublin architecture, Irish crafts and folklore, the troubles in Northern Ireland. And then, as you might have seen from some of those clips, you might have um, may or may not have uh, recognized some people, but there were, there were extensive unedited interviews with cultural, literary and political figures like Charles Haughey, Louis Le Broquet, Jim Sheridan, Gabriel Byrne, Patrick Scott, Doris Lessing, Margaret Atwood, Richard Ford, Maeve Binchy, Mary Robinson, Maureen O'Hara, and on and on and on. So the project itself, um, there were two main types of objects um, that needed to be ingested into the archive the magnetic tape migration. So we were going to bring in the analog tape into the archive, but we wanted to migrate them to digital format for uh, future proofing. Um, and then the born digital files that were coming in on uh, hard drives. So both of these types of objects came with their own challenges that had to be overcome in order to ingest them into our archives, into our archive um, as apes. Uh, just to say that we use the, we follow uh, quite religiously, um, it is our Bible, the OAS model, um, but we also follow the Spectrum guidelines. Spectrum is the Collections Trust, Collections Management Standard for museums. Um, so when we're thinking about ingesting stuff into the archive, we always have OAS on our mind. Um, so these four um, tape formats, five tape formats here, these were the different type of tape formats that we had to migrate to digital format to then ingest into the archive. Uh, so uh, Betacam SP, Digital Betacam, Mini DV, DVCam, DATS. Uh, one of the challenges we had with the tapes was that we didn't, Eugene Finn was cataloging, but we didn't want him to catalog directly from the tapes because playback, stop and rewind, etc. The tapes could be damaged before we got to migrate them. Uh, and we wanted to migrate them as soon as possible. And then that meant that we had to uh, create access proxies almost immediately in order to give them to Eugene so that he could catalog them. Um, so we needed to migrate quickly and we needed to be able to create um, access proxy copies quickly. Uh, we decided to do in-house tape migration. Um, this was quite a large, large scale digitization project and the first kind of big digitization project we took on with tape we had done some um, film digitization before. 
Um, but we decided to undertake this in-house because it afforded us the ability to monitor, control the ingest at close quarters. Um, we also saw it as an investment in upskilling our staff and ourselves. We are our staff. Um, and we took the time to test out and research the best practice procedures for tape capture. So on the back of this, we drew up detailed guidelines for migration of each of the individual tape formats on each of the individual decks and the different uh, capture uh, tools that we had. And then we also drew up uh, documented guidelines for quality control, including QC and deck maintenance. Uh, once all of this was done, we still needed to figure out what to do with the migrated digital files. Um, this was going to be a huge number of digital files compared to coming in at the same time that were going to be acquired at the same time, much larger than we were used to. Um, okay, but then the more challenging part of this were the actual hard drives. We'd never dealt with this type of born digital material before. We receive in born digital material from our um, service contracts with the Broadcasting Authority of Ireland and uh, Screen Ireland. Um, and we knew how to deal with these born digital files that we come in, but the hard drives were kind of like opening up a new um, a new box of surprise at Christmas. We didn't know what was going to be there. Um, what was there was XD cams, P2s, and converted uh, QuickTimes. These hard drives were Chase hard drives from camera rushes direct from the camera, um, edited um, uh, uh, projects that he'd been working on. There was something like 22, 27 massive hard drives altogether. Anyway, this was all new to us. When we opened them up, this is what we saw. Um, literally an example of two different hard drives here. I don't know if you can see my, you probably can't see my cursor, but those OE numbers on the left, they are, um, each of them are hard drives. And then you can see across how there's different projects or partial projects within each hard drive. Um, then maybe within that partial project, there might be, you know, a shooting um, a location like Kong, <laughs> Dublin or Waterford, and then a card, a camera card. And within that camera card, um, and a card, you might have one, maybe two cards for a day's shooting. You just have a very complex uh, set of files. Um, so we opened this up and we were literally like, oh my God, what are we gonna do with this? Um, but you can see how complex it was. Each of those individual um, uh, folders there, the Kong folders there, they are holding individual clips, the kind of press and pause, uh, pause and stop that Shay and his team would have been working on during the day. So when we opened this up, we, we didn't know what to make of this. Um, we didn't even really know what would constitute an object or a representation for us, what we were gonna um, package up into an archival information package. So just to say as well, we use the uh, premise terminology has helped us enormously. For those of you who don't know what premise is, um, it's a data dictionary for preservation metadata. Um, and uh, we use terms like representation or object really helps us to, um, to uh, uh, be able to understand each other basically. Um, but anyway, it also fits in really well with OIS spectrum. So OIS spectrum and premise are our triangle of um, the holy trinity, shall we say. Um, so, Looking at these images, it first was kind of like a whole alien language to us trying to figure it out. But we did our research and we just we investigated, we discussed these at length. Eventually, we figured out what was a representation to us. We figured out what we needed to do in order to be able to archive this material. But then we needed to figure out how we were going to do it. And that was a challenge. Um, so just to show you as well, here, what we did in order to be able to make sense of these hard drives, we took these text uh, tree te uh, trees into uh, put them in a text document so that uh, we could make sense of it. So here's just an example of a, of a text document uh, showing all of the different oh, oops, showing all of the different files that would be within one hard drive. We estimated there were 390,000 files altogether between all the hard drives that we had to uh, go through and make sense of. So this was sort of like these tree text documents were so that we could audit and make sense and figure out exactly what was where, um, which we eventually did. 
Um, okay, so how did we deal with this? Um, the context that we were already in, in late 2015, Kieran had already launched the um, IFI scripts on GitHub, um, heavily influenced by and inspired by Dave Rice in uh, CUNY City University of New York. Um, and we were already using this microservice architecture to execute everyday preservation activities. So this was fitting very much in with our DFAS or uh, digital preservation and access strategy. We had kind of discovered that the use of open source um, software had empowered us to be able to, it opened so many new doors for us to be able to make uh, bespoke uh, uh, software not being linked to expensive uh, proprietary software, avoiding vendor lock, and just being able to absolutely control our own um, our own preservation futures. So already at this point, Kieran had written scripts on for fixity and copying, um, movement and transcoding. And when we were looking at how we were going to get through these challenges that we were facing, we realised that the only way. On this particular project, the only way we get through it is through automation and through writing our own scripts and writing our own software. Um, so Loopline was going to be the first end-to-end -end project where we were going to take this approach completely, take that approach that was outlined in, in our DPAS, Digital Preservation Access Strategy. We realized at this point that the potential for automation was huge and that we could use the Loopline project um, to tease out these processes for the work we were doing there that would then be able to be replicated in the future through the rest of the accession we were doing. So we use this project to devise processes for accessioning, for archival information packaging, for normalization, um, in order to be able to share that with everyone else and also kind of move forward into the future with these procedures and processes. And then once we had kind of figured that out and discussed it, then Kieran wrote these beautiful scripts. Um, this project literally transformed everything for us because through this project, we were able to figure out these workflows and document the guidelines. So from starting with tape migration and quality control, then down to digital file ingestion, archival information packaging, submission information packaging. You can see there on the screen the OE, meaning object entry um, packages, there are submission information packages, and then on the right, they turn into archival information packages, the AAA, meaning accessioning, I think, three times, because we really like accessioning. Um, and then, um, really importantly, our normalization policies, which isn't like a policy because it's constantly changing and will continue to have to change, but we discussed this at length um, to figure out how, what we were going to normalize, how we were going to normalize, and then Kieran wrote these amazing scripts for different, um, different for different uh, formats for normalization. And then scripts for creation of access pro proxies, scripts for harvesting PB core metadata, and then most importantly, not most, they're all really important, I keep on saying that, but um, concatenating the clips from the camera card. So what we had figured out through those camera cards were each of those individual clips needed to be concatenated together into one bigger clips so that that could be a representation that was put in an archival information package, but still be able to hold the individual clips as individual items or assets. It's complicated, but Kieran will show you what we mean, and we were able to do that. Um, so now that I am out of breath, I'm going to show, going to hand you over to Kieran, who's going to give you a quick tour of the IFI scripts, and then show you some of the applications that he wrote and that we used in this project. Sorry. Hello, everybody. Um, I think I might just switch to the full desktop view. Might be just the easiest thing. Uh, there might be a lot going on here now, uh, but you know, might just focus our attention for the moment on the actual documentation before we go any further. Because um, I'm just going to show you a couple of example scenarios where the IFI scripts were used, and uh, to just exemplify some of the things that Kaz and Raylene were talking about. Um, but I want to just maybe take a step back and um, show how, if anyone is interested, you can interact with um, these scripts in different ways. So, well, the first thing, you know, if you just Google IFI scripts, all one word, you're probably going to be taken to this GitHub page over here, which uh, Raylene showed you a screenshot of. Uh, this can be quite intimidating for people at first, um, 
but all GitHub pages look roughly the same. You have the code here, all the different uh, Python scripts. You have an issue tracker up here, which I can go into in a second. Um, but if you scroll down, you usually get access to some documentation. Um, and in our case, we actually link over to read the docs, which hopefully provides nicer documentation. It gives a sense of what we were actually trying to do, some example scenarios, and there's a table of contents about installation. Um, and I just want to go through these very, very briefly. Um, even when I heard William talking about uh, the usage of tools and the effective usage of tools, like the i5 scripts do a lot of, uh, like we wrote a lot of, um, and say unique preservation actions into them. But in almost every script, we are piggybacking on top of existing open source tools um, and projects, pretty much always command line tools. Um, so generally for every script, you'll probably have to install the media info um, tool, which extracts uh, technical metadata in quite a human friendly way, or it can be in a really machine friendly, machine readable friendly way. Um, FFmpeg, FFprobe do a lot of our metadata extraction as well and transcoding and normalization. Um, they also help with actually verifying a lot of our normalization processes as well. And we've got a lot more down here, like the wonderful Siegfried and Exif tool, um, or sync and raw code and things like that. Um, we also have some guidelines on how you can contribute to IFI scripts. This can be just you know, coming up with um, an idea, reporting a bug, um, and yeah, and what I really like is the credits section, which is very, very long, and it's got a big list. I haven't added to this in a while. I'm sure there's more people now, um, but every single one of these people are here because the scripts and this project would have been that little bit different if it wasn't for every person's involvement here. And I can kind of stand behind that, like every person there, like they all had some sort of a contribution, even if they don't even know it. Um, and maybe actually in the usage section, it could be handy if you're not really familiar with scripts in general, or even if you might be a student, from what I understand, there might be some students from Aberystwyth uh, that might be looking in on this. And I should just say hello to all of them because I'm enrolled in that uh, distance learning course, although I'm a very bad student. Um, but it, 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 I've found myself when I was starting off in digital preservation that um, like if you're looking through OAIS or looking through a lot of um, guidelines for best practice, you're not always um, given a sense of how do you just sit down with a hard drive and engage in digital preservation activities, like what tool do you use, what does an archival package actually look like, these kind of things. So this might just give you a rough sense of what an archive might use. Other archives might be doing slightly different things, um, but there's going to be a fair cross-section um, in terms of the activities we're all engaged in. So they're in these headings here, like scripts relating to fixity, transcoding, arrangement. Um, that's kind of relating to what Raylene was talking about. A big part of this project was making sense of a lot of the chaos. So we would package up um, groupings of files um, into a more meaningful arrangement and forming submission information packages and eventually gradually forming archival information packages. Um, there's even an experimental premise section, which I, I might talk about in the future. Um, yeah, and then, so I, I want to go back to the actual IFI scripts for a second, and like here's all the code and everything, and like it might look quite intimidating and complicated um, to a seasoned Python programmer. They would probably say, "Oh, these scripts are really simple, and they're almost like child's play or something." And if you're not a seasoned programmer, you might think it's really complicated. But the thing is, in order to run any of these scripts, whether they're Python or Ruby or Bash scripts, you do not need to be a programmer. Um, if you've ever ran, like, did a formula in Excel, you're, that is probably more complicated than running um, a script in a, in a terminal, like in OS X, or on CMD in Windows, or something like that. Um, so everybody who engages with digital collections in the Irish Film Institute, whether they can, most of them can't code, but everyone can use the command line and they can run these scripts. Um, and just two other things I want to show you here. One is, well, I was hoping there was a contributions section, which doesn't seem to be present in Safari for some reason. Maybe it's because Safari is out of date, but it had the list of everyone who's actually contributed, which is a bunch of IFI staff, but also people like Rito Cromer um, and Ashley Bluer from Artifactual, 
and even Michael Campus Quinn from UC Berkeley. And one of, them, one of the common ways that people engage with these scripts um, are by logging issues. It's like an issue tracker. And you can see that there's 168 that have been closed and 53 that are currently open, which is a, a very high number. Um, for example, here, this is um, something that was raised by somebody called Boogiehead in the United Kingdom, who's uh, Joanna White in the MACE archive. So she's running uh, these scripts, testing them out, taking certain ones, um, changing them to her needs because it's open source. She can do whatever she wants. Um, and then we also have things like pull requests, which is when one of us tries to develop a new piece of code, but we're not entirely comfortable with going live with it. We want to get feedback from um, our fellow colleagues or perhaps um, even external um, archivists as well. And this is a good example here where um, we're trying to work with a fairly complex issue of where we have one single object, um, but there are multiple intellectual works within the object and just kind of dealing with that. So we're making our way through that and it's all a very open discussion. You can see that like myself and Raylene here are talking through it and trying to come out the other side. Um, and then you have somebody like Michael Campus Quinn from Berkeley who just gives a Godspeed remark because I think maybe he appreciates that this is a complex uh, question. And so yeah, so there, uh, I hi I'm highlighting these because I feel like anyone who contributes an issue or comments in any way, that that's as much of a meaningful contribution to this project as writing a piece of code. Um, okay, so I'm over here in the um, a pretty simple bash terminal in OSX, and I'm just gonna show maybe just a handful of little scripts that um, we might have used on the project. So I have some test files here, which you know they don't really have much meaningful content or anything like that, but um, this is an example here. We can pretend that this was an, if we took a, an analog videotape and we migrated it to an uncompressed video file. That, that's generally the process that we did here. Um, we would digitize uncompressed, but we chose the FFV1 um, video codec within the Matroska um, MKV container for our preservation file format. And so we weren't really uh, satisfied with just running a straight normalization process where we converted from one file format to another. Um, thanks to the work of Dave Rice, we were aware of um, methods of actually verifying the authenticity of these processes um, using lossless verification and things like that. And so what we were able to do with the scripts was, yes, we would transcode, but it, uh, the script would also um, verify the losslessness, uh, verify the integrity of the whole process. It would extract a bunch of metadata um, create submission information packages and it would kind of do it all at once and no matter how simple or how complex the package everything was looking roughly the same it became a lot easier for us to manage everything um, so in this scenario uh, we actually use a thing called make FFE one on the project but for today I'm going to use a more advanced version of that which is normalize.py um, a lot of our scripts have got a help file built into them so you just need to run the script name like in this case normalize.py with dash h and you get some, some help and it gives you some arguments. But we can you know, be pretty simple here and just say we want to normalize. We say dash i is our input. This video file. So I just drag, I'm not sure if the cursor is working here, but all I had to do there, instead of me typing it out manually, you can just drag and drop your file name into the terminal and it'll auto-complete. When I was first learning how to use the terminal, uh, this was a huge stumbling block. I didn't actually know that you could do that. So um, I was typing everything out and it was very frustrating. Okay, and we want to just declare what our output is. So you just say dash O, and I have a folder I've created here called staging. Um, and so I also want to just put in the SIF argument. So instead of just having this big dump of files and logs, we wanted to package it up quite nicely into a, um, the IFI's um, uh, submission information package. So, hey, um, it's asking who I am, and it's gonna ask for an identifier. Let's just call it one, two, three, four, five. Um, these are all like really easily editable. Um, if anyone was interested in, you know, you could just really just do a control or a find and replace. Um, so okay, it's going to do a whole bunch of things because the file is so small. Everything happens super quick. Um, so ffmpeg ran. <laughs> this is going to be quite difficult to make sense of, but we were given like a success judgment, which is kind of okay enough for the moment. And so let's take a look in the staging area of what it produced. So it produced something approaching um, uh, submission information. It's actually quite close to becoming an archival package. We, we run it, um, 
we run another process, um, an, an accessioning process after this, which just adds one or two extra things like a SHA-512 manifest, some digital forensics XML, and it finalizes the archival package and generates some extra metadata and things. But it, this is pretty close to what we have. So we have our checksum manifest. Um, we have our package here with a uh, UUID as the identifier. And it's taken our uncompressed video file and normalized it to our preservation file format. Um, there's a supplement, some supplemental metadata where we have technical metadata and some digital forensics, um, like file system metadata about the file that we actually normalized. And if we got some very, very um, granular logs as well in saying things like um, when something started, like we've using some premise terminology like agent names, event details, and then maybe like what tools were used, media info, the exact version for the metadata extraction. And then we had a lossless verification process here. FFmpeg was the agent and the event outcome was lossless. So that would be like a success. It, it would now be able to go on to the next phase. But the script keeps going and it runs um, the SIP creator tool, which is what actually packaged it up into that um, file structure that you saw. Um, okay, so that's like one example. Um, let's say if we wanted to make an access copy of that, we could just run a thing called BitC. BitC is a, it stands for burnt in time code, which is just adding a watermark to the image. We do that uh, for making our access copies so we can kind of share them and that if they get intercepted by some malicious person that- uh, We know where they came from. Yeah, we know where they came from and they're quite heavily stamped. So I can just say bitsy.py, drag and drop that. Um, if I just press enter, it would make a sidecar, but I'm just gonna say, dash O, I wanna put it somewhere else. Let's put it into a proxies folder. And there it's made this proxy file. Um, it's, it's quite small, but you can see there's our watermark and here's some time code. And so that's roughly, um, like we were able to automate that. Like if we were to migrate 10 or 20 tapes in a day, we had like a, a batch script that would just run all of those processes and um, run backups as well as um, making the access copies that would then be put onto Dropbox for people, um, for like the catalogers to look at. I'm kind of conscious of us running out of time. There, there were other scripts like where we're gonna process the camera cards and stuff. Um, I mean, I might just show, um, we started. Yeah, we started it, so maybe. I'm gonna run the actual SIP creator tool. So when we were, um, we kind of did our, um, we figured out how we wanted to arrange some of the born digital camera cards that came from um, hard drives. A lot of times it would be a scenario like this, like if I go back to my, um, just my test folder here. Uh, so this is really actually just some dummy test data, but this is very similar to what it might look like. This would be, a, I guess you'd call it a complex digital object where this is quite a, this is three clips within the one package. This, each folder here, each MXF would have been, um, the cameraman would have pressed, or the camera person would have pressed record um, when, he, when they finished pressing record. Then it would have, and, and wanted to record a new video clip, we would have had a brand new folder and so on and so forth. And because these cameras had dual um, cards in them, sometimes you would actually see, uh, you could have three, you know, maybe two of these packages. They might look like they're actually distinct, but they're really running into each other and there, there's a seamless link between the two of them. And so SIP Creator was really handy for us because we could take multiple um, source objects, regardless of how complex they were, and this was a nice way of us packaging, in, packaging all up into one fairly consistent um, package. So uh, in this case, we're gonna be fairly generous and just say it was just one card. And it's just as simple as saying, so for sipcreator.py, what's your input? I could take more stuff here, grab in more files, but in this case, it's, it's very simple. And we just say, what is our output? And let's say um, it's the staging area again. Um, we were using different um, external raids and stuff for this. Um, again, uh, asking who we, who I am. And let's say this is uh, what are we, one, two, and nine. Oh, it's doing a whole bunch of stuff again. Generally what it's doing is just, it's, it's generating fixing information, um, extracting metadata, um, logging every single thing that it's doing uh, for later analysis. Like we have some other scripts as well that take those text files and it turns them into valid premise XML. The thing about that is um, 
we don't actually have a usage for the premise XML quite yet. Uh, but what we do have is a need for humans to look at the log files to verify that everything's going okay. So for the time being, um, kind of more human readable log files was a lot more useful. So that's kind of where we're focusing our efforts. So let's go back to staging. And this is what that package now looks like. Um, I mean, it might look familiar to you, like, like something for Bagot. I mean, with, um, Bagot really just packages something up. Um, you can add some administrative metadata, but it's really just creating um, you know, a folder structure for you and um, your checksum manifest. But it's not really what happens inside of your data folder within your bag is really still up to you and how you structure your logs and your metadata and all of this. Um, so here, like, it's been packaged up into the objects. This is really like whatever our, to use, premise terminology, the representation of the intellectual entity sits in here. Um, but it's extracted a bunch of metadata for us um, as well. Um, we've got, so that, like the packages all look pretty similar, even if um, they're all uh, very different formats. And so as Raylene was saying, like we do, didn't really, it's quite difficult to make something like this accessible to people, like to put it up on a web player or to let researchers take a look at it, or even to have a catalog or take a look at it. We've seen examples where there's maybe 150 of these individual files within a package, and we would have one catalog record, like a descriptive catalog record for this. And um, it's, it's a bit much to expect a cataloger to go through each one, they might miss something. So what we did was we would had a, a further, like we would preserve this particular package, but we would also uh, concatenate everything together um, to create a more normalized version. And this wasn't just an access copy, like we treated this as um, another representation, a more preservation friendly, uh, but also more access friendly version, um, which was lossless as well. We would retain the actual AV data, but it would just be in a nicer format. So we wrote a script called concat.py for this. Um, and it's very similar again, you just declare what your input is. In this case, it's that package. So I just take the stick creator package that we just made and my output, Again, let's put it into staging. Uh, so you're probably seeing a pattern here. It's very similar every time. So let's just say OE 9999. Okay, it, it kind of processed everything too fast. But if, um, let's take a look at the, at the package that it's made, though, in here. Again, looks very similar. But now we have a single MKV object. So every video object that was in, that complex package is now wrapped up into a single file that flows seamlessly. And we were able to insert um, Matroska chapters, kind of like DVD chapters, that referenced um, the file name that each clip came from. So we were able to trace things back and things like that. Um, we have some metadata about the file, but it's, it's a lot simpler. Um, and all of the different processes that happened, the validation, the concatenation, we have quite detailed log files for each one, should we need to question them. And so, and here's the um, here's the log file that we have for the actual concat process. And let's just search. Was it lossless? Uh, yes. According to this, the event outcome was a pass. So uh, this concatenation was valid. We can prove that every frame, every um, uh, Every, every piece of data that was in our source object is now in our um, concatenated object. And so if we were, like we now have three packages in here, all the different kinds in the staging area. Let me just make a fake scenario of, let's just imagine this is like some big LTO tape rope, uh, library. Um, we had a process called masscopy.py that we had run at the end of the day. If everything passed our quality control processes, um, this was really just, something that would do some mass backups for us, but it would also perform a fixity check as well at the same time. Um, well, okay, again, everything ran so quick there, it, it's, it's difficult to know what's going on. But what this is telling us is that there were three successes. Um, what we generally find is that we, about maybe one in a million file transfers, we tend to see a, a checksum mismatch. Uh, a million might sound like a very large number, but when you deal with image sequences, like one feature film might have 150,000 files. So we reach that mark pretty quick. And uh, so maybe as the files are making their way through the network cables, one bit flips or something. 
And so what's actually happened here is that for every one of those packages, it's made a backup inside of preservation storage, and it has created a brand new checksum manifest at the destination, and then it's done a, um, a comparison between the source manifest and the destination manifest. And for each one, it gives you a little ver um, uh, status here. Your files have reached your destination and the checksums match. If there's any discrepancy whatsoever, it will flag a warning, and then you'll get your general summary here at the very bottom. Um, so there are many other scripts that we use, but this is just like some example scenarios. Um, but I want to show one very last one. Um, as part of that accession Karen, process... sorry, I think we're going to have to call it a day today because we've gone over the hour and there's just so much to show, I know. Um, and you've been doing a great job of, of demonstrating it all. It's all been fascinating. We've got lots of uh, comments in the box as well saying how cool it is and lots of other things. But I think we're going to have to wrap it up and, and cool. maybe have another hour's session another day. Yeah, <laughs> that, yeah the very last thing there was the extraction of the technical metadata because, of course, metadata is... Uh, so important. But, um, but trust me, there is more metadata stuff, but we just didn't have a chance to show it. So I'm going to shimmy out of the way now and go back to Kaz. <laughs> Thank you so much. As you can see, it's quite a long, lengthy process and lots to talk about. So yeah. Uh, yeah, right up against it. Yeah, for sure. But, I mean, we do have, uh, just given the time and all, we should uh, we give it an hour, so we should let people uh, start to drift off. But listen, can you put contact details up on the screen uh, for us? That would be maybe a good way for people who do have questions might be able to follow up uh, either offline. And as Sarah says, maybe we should get together and do a a, a quick, you know, kind of follow up. Uh, we can have a metadata special. Today. Yeah, we could have yeah, a metadata exactly. special if you're inclined. If you can see that there is how you get to um, IFI scripts, we can send around the. Um, uh, our slides as well. That would be um, great. And then if you could share the email, that would be awesome. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So the re this uh, recording of this episode and the whole series, in fact, um, are all, the other uh, episodes are made available on the, the various event pages, and this one will be as well. So um, by the end of the week, uh, fingers crossed, and, and we can share your, your slides as well um, and any other kind of relevant and referenced materials so that's yeah definitely can do that great stuff well, well listen thank you thank you very much uh, what's that you've got in front of you there uh, Kieran? oh that's a right blocker i just saw it there and i thought that might be appropriate to show <laughs> <laughs> you're bringing props in now uh brilliant listen uh, thank you all three of you very much thank you also for the work that's gone in behind this because you know it's easy to do well it's not easy to do a demo but it's it's actually years of work that's come together in this hour so uh we are really, really appreciative. We encourage as far as possible people to follow up with you, to link to you, to uh, understand your work, and not only that, but to contribute back because you have been so generous as to share that it only seems appropriate that others are now able to contribute back to you. So it's, a, as I said at the start, it represents to me, uh, to my mind, the, the, the great or the best ethics of the digital preservation community with super collections, uh, great effort to put them together, uh, and also openness and friendliness and accessibility with the tools that you have developed. So uh, a, a very well-deserved uh, presentation of, a, of an award. Uh, and as I say, maybe we will I'll leave it to Sarah to organize, but maybe we can get a special uh, done with about metadata. What do you do after you've run the script? <laughs> uh, it's the big, the million-dollar question.